Good morning, Chandler. It is a joy and a pleasure to welcome you all here. Obviously, that guest pastor last week used up all of my battery power, but oh well, I'm thankful that he was able to step in and uh, let me have that Sunday off. A few announcements before we begin. Uh, today, we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and tomorrow night, consistory gathers and meets. So please be praying for our elders and deacons tomorrow night as we do the church's business. And on that note, it's that time of year again when we are looking for nominees for elders and deacons. So if there is someone you have in mind, please nominate them. Or if God is laying a message on your heart, uh, we definitely are looking for volunteers to be elders and deacons as well. We also look forward to a combined service at the end of this month on October 29th. The combined service will be here and we will welcome the Claussons back to Chandler as they give us a special music worship on that Sunday. And with that, brothers and sisters, may the grace, mercy, and peace of him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, be with you all. As we prepare to worship our Lord, let us begin with a reading from Psalm 25. Psalm 25 of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right. He teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from their anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. Brothers and sisters, will you join me in worshiping the God who redeems us? Will you please rise and join me in singing number 224, We Have Come Into His House.
Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ be with you all. As God has welcomed you here today, please turn to your neighbor and welcome them. Good morning, Maddie. People of God, will you join me in making our confession of faith as we say together the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From, from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Brothers and sisters, just as surely as we confess our faith, let's also confess our sins, knowing that Jesus pardons us and calls us his own. Will you please join me in prayer? O oh, gracious God, you who know us and formed us with your own hands, you who have mercy upon us, and you treat us according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercies, we ask that you will blot out our transgressions, Wash us thoroughly from our iniquities and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions and our sin is ever before us. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Cast us not from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of our salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Children of God, hear the good news. You are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through the spirit that dwells in you. And all God's children say, Amen. As a hymn of thanks and praise, we join me in singing number 329, There is Power in the Blood.
may be seated. At this time, I invite our deacons to come forward and lead us in the giving of our gifts. Shall we pray? Dear God, please be with us today as we worship with you and be with Seth, Pastor Seth as he leads us in worship. And thank you for all the blessings that you have given to us. We thank you for a great surgery for me and also for letting Glenn heal so that he could join us again in worship. And please be with the farmers this week. In Jesus' name, amen. As we gather to pray, uh, we're going to have a special prayer for the Bruxworts. They sent us a newsletter update. It's been a busy summer for them up in Alaska, flying kids and counselors and supplies all over from different parts of Alaska. Uh, so they are very thankful for another successful season. They're thankful that they are able to share the gospel and uh, minister to over 400 children. And they're thankful for the, well, that God is with them as uh, Brian has had eye surgery and Elizabeth has had 
uh, work done on our knee, so we are continue to pray for them as well. And speaking of praying, I see our kids leaving. I want to pray for them before they get there. So Greg, can you round up those kids and bring them back? <laughs> oh. All right. Well, I wasn't expecting them to leave quite so soon, but... Uh, as I was saying, uh, newsletter from the Bruxfords are uh, very full of thanks and praises for God's grace and their continued work and ministry, as well as being w with them through their uh, medical needs. And they continue to ask for prayers as they continue to work with Mark in Alaska, that God will be with them as they, well, as they get ready to welcome another grandchild and do the work of the church. So I see Parker, yeah. Come on up. Oh, did Sydney escape? <laughs> okay, she's kind of shy. Well, now, something that I, a habit I tried to get us to do, but we kind of got out of habit when COVID happened, and I completely forgot about it, is Parker, can you hold up your right hand and make an L? We're going to sign the Lord. We're going to put the hand across her chest onto our shoulder. Greg, you can do this with us too. So we're going to say, the Lord, and we're kind of like a belt buckle, like a seat belt. We're going to come down to our other hip. The Lord be with you. And can you put your hands together like this? All right, let's do it together. The Lord be with you. And the congregation responds, and also with you. And with that blessing, I dismiss you to Children's Church. And may the Spirit dwell within you richly. He's growing fast. <laughs> All right, let us gather to pray. Holy God, I thank you for this day that you have made, a holy day of rest and of worship, a day to gather as your people, with your spirit in your house, as sons and daughters of God Most High. So Lord, I thank you for the gift of children and grandchildren, of parents and grandparents. I thank you that your grace extends from generation to generation. And I pray that we will grow in our faith and our obedience so that we may ever walk with Jesus, our Lord and loving Savior. So, Lord Jesus, we pray that you will be in this world. Send your Holy Spirit to be with us and all of those who are suffering today. We give you thanks and praise that so many of our members are healing and recovering and that we can gather together in this church. But we look out in the world and we see violence and illness that separate families. So, Lord, I pray that you will seek and save the lost. Will you be with the fatherless and the widow? Will you be with the soldiers who are fighting Ukraine? Lord, we pray for an end to that conflict. We pray that you will be with all those who are suffering from drought and violence across Africa and South America. We be with our own nation, Lord, as we deal with our own hurts and violence for those who suffer from addictions and crime. Lord, no place in this world can we say is perfect. We all need your Holy Spirit. So I thank you that you continue to raise up people, men and women, to go and carry your name out into the dark corners of this world. We thank you for the Bruxfords and that your hand and spirit are with them. We pray that they'll continue to be faithful as they end one season and prepare for winter. Lord, I pray that you'll give them wisdom as, and traveling mercies as they come visit the various churches down in the lower 48. Will you bless their work? We also pray for the Hubers and Dwar Silvas for their work in Ethiopia and, and in Eastern Europe. Lord, I pray that the work they do will bring peace and the name of Jesus to those who are hurting and lost. We pray for our own nation, Lord, as we begin another election year. I pray that we will treat each other as neighbors and as fellow citizens. But more than that, may we treat each other as children of God. Even if we disagree, Lord, I pray that we'll do so respectfully and earnestly, seeking to be obedient to your calling. So come, Lord Jesus, bless our church as we seek to continue to worship you, to faithfully proclaim the name of Jesus here in Chandler and around the world. May all our work, Lord, be done for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us conclude our time of prayer by singing our doxology.
Praise God from Our scripture reading today is Exodus chapter 3. But first, let us pray that the Lord may illuminate our reading. Holy God, from whom all good things come, I thank you for the gift of your word, and I pray that your spirit may fill our hearts and minds so that we may see Jesus today. May our reading, Lord, be to us good food and good drinks so that we become more and more like Jesus. May we be faithful as Moses, filled with the power of your spirit, in Jesus we pray. Amen. Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hizzites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I'll make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord.
seeing is believing. That's what popular wisdom teaches us, but how true is it? Now, it is important to keep a questioning attitude when dealing with salesmen or with politicians. For we all know how politicians love to make big, outrageous claims. And when we hear that, we better unleash our inner Missourian and say, show me, before we buy what they're selling. But then, of course, there are all the things that we believe without having seen. For example, I believe that the country of Mongolia exists, even though I've never seen it. I believe it exists because enough trustworthy sources have told me about it, and so I believe. And then there are all the things that we see, but still don't believe. Now, my uncle Arthur is a fantastic example of this. He is a magician. He does many wonderful tricks and puts on a great show. He's even really good at sharing the gospel. And this little video clip I'd like to show you, he will share with us the gospel message. And in this little video, you're going to see and hear things that challenge your understanding of how the world works. So I'd like to share with you the amazing one rope trick. I know, I got two pieces of rope, but I use it as a comparison. See, this is like my limited imagination of what it is to follow Jesus as compared to his imagination of me following him. His imagination is much greater than mine and what I can imagine. So that's why even at the very, very beginning, Jesus says, look, I'm going to come down and become man and I'll walk among them. And that's what he did. Jesus walked among us actually to have followers, to see what it is that how God is with his people. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We're one. And that's pretty cool. So he raises people from the dead, lets blind people see, does a ton of cool things, and we, the world, hang them on a cross. There's a lot to that story. But what he did on that cross was he bore the sins of the entire world and all of humanity because he was God, he was able to remove all sins from humanity in this entire world and put it away. He's truly God and truly man. And in doing that, he says, look, my relationship with you is now not based upon what you've done, but what I've done. <laughs> and he makes us whole. This could be hard to imagine. You can imagine, you know, well, is that really all sins? Aren't there some sins that, that he couldn't pay for? that are still stuck there that we have to deal with? And Jesus says, look, you don't get it. He goes, I'm truly God, I'm truly man. My death on the cross paid for everything, once and for all. That can be hard to imagine. It really can. Especially if you, if you imagine, how could that be? How could he actually do that? Well, you see, Jesus became man, but at the same time, he was truly God. He was truly infinite. He had no beginning, no middle or end. He created this whole thing. He became part of this thing. So the same power that created life on this planet is the same power that lifted Jesus up again from the dead, which was his own power, which is really, really hard to imagine. But I know it's true. I also know this is true, that every day he calls me to follow him. He says, be with me. And when I say, but Jesus, I don't know if I can. I, I still got this, this, and this in my life. He says, it's already put away. It's already done. Whew. And we are already one. Wow. And so I can imagine that following Jesus is, is a continuation of being one with him now. Even on this earth and when we go into his, his true heavenly kingdom. Amazing. Every tear dried. No more sorrow. And also goodness and just being in his presence. And that's what I have to share with you today. I hope that helps with your imagination. Maybe just, maybe just a little bit. <laughs> All right, love you guys. See ya. Now in that short video, what parts did you believe? Now I'm pretty sure the stuff you saw with your eyes you didn't believe, but I hope that the things you heard with your ears, that is what you believed. But here's the wonderful thing. Even though we don't necessarily believe what we saw, what we saw helped us understand what we heard. And when we deepen our understanding, we strengthen our faith. And when we strengthen our faith, we're able to be more obedient to what God says to us. Because God is speaking to us each and every day. And even though we're not able to see God with our eyes, well, thanks be to God that he provides us with signs and wonders, things that we can see, 
things that which strengthen our faith. And our faith isn't magic. Rather, our faith is our obedience to God. But to better understand that, let's take another look at Exodus chapter 3. And as we continue our series on what it means to be the image of God, this is just a quick little review from what we learned from Exodus, or sorry, from Genesis. God made us in his image. He made us to be creators, to order things. So whether we're out in the field planting or harvesting, whether we're in our shops, we're fixing a tractor, whether we're painting or singing a song, whether we're teaching or raising our children, whatever it is we're doing, we're fulfilling our mandate that God gave us to fill this world, to be fruitful and subdue it. But we also know that there is much darkness in the world. The serpent has entered. Part of what it means to be the image of God is that we become crushers of the serpent's head. We saw how Cain failed to do that, but we are thankful that Jesus the Son of God came to crush the serpent's head for us and give us the Holy Spirit so that we can go and do likewise, that we can battle Satan and send him away, much like how King Saul did when he rescued a city and many of his allies said, hey, we should take advantage and kill our enemies. But Saul said, no, this is the day that the Lord has saved us. No one will be put to death. Instead, he forgave those who opposed him. That is how Saul crushed the serpent's head, and that is how we can be like the image of God today, through forgiveness. And now we come to Exodus chapter 3, where we see another story of a simple man becoming like the image of God. Of course, it's, we think of Moses, and we think Moses, one of the greatest heroes of the Bible. But it's important to remember that he started off a simple man. Oh, sure, he grew up in the palace of Pharaoh, but he ran away from the law. He became a shepherd, just taking care of his flocks and his herds out in the wilderness, much like we take care of our own herds and our fields. Such was the job of Moses, taking care of God's creation. And, Mo and God took this simple man, and he performed a wonder for him to see. Well, because we can't see God, Moses couldn't see God, so God had to create something that Moses would see, that would get his curiosity intrigued and go and investigate. Now, it's quite possible that Moses might have wished he never did that, because God gave him a calling. He also gave Moses God's own name. As we look through this story, the story that we've heard many times over, we see familiar sights, the burning bush, the command to take off your shoes, to worship. But when we get so comfortable with these stories, we often forget the wonder of it. Can you imagine seeing a bush on fire and not being consumed? Just how wonderful and awe-inspiring would that be? Well, brothers and sisters, we see that happening every day. The Spirit, the fire of God, the Holy Spirit is a tongue of flame that rests upon us all. Each and every one of you is on fire with the Holy Spirit, and yet you are not being consumed. You are not being burned up. Indeed, you are being filled with the power of God. But this is something that's ordinary, happens every day. We get used to it, and we forget the wonder of being called God's own. Now, at the very beginning, it is a wonderful sight. But let me remind you that in the 40 years in the wilderness, the pillar of God went before them. Fire at night and smoke by day, and they got used to it. In a similar way, we get used to being in God's presence. Now, for us, that's normal human behavior, which is why we need constant reminders, constant signs that spark our imagination and get us to think and wonder once more. Because God just didn't want Moses to come and have a chat with him. God was calling Moses to a big, big mission, something that would exceed Moses' capacity, something Moses would only be successful at if Moses was obedient to God. You see, right before chapter 3, 
we read about the Israelites being in slavery, and they're crying out. Now, what's surprising is that when the Israelites are groaning in their slavery and crying out to their affliction, the Bible just says that they cry out. They're not crying out to God. They're not moaning and asking for deliverance. They're just being oppressed. They've forgotten the Lord, their God, and they're so enslaved and broken down that they don't even know that they can call out to him. But here is the wonder of our God. It doesn't matter if they're calling out to God in the right way. God still hears the cries of the oppressed. And because he remembers his covenant with them, he remembers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God chooses Moses to be his appointed one, to go and be a sign and a wonder to the people of Israel, the elders, and to Pharaoh and the Egyptians, so that they will know that what is happening is happening because of God. But that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. God gives Moses a big command, and Moses, of course, is a little worried about it. Is he going to be able to do this? Well, God gives Moses a sign, a sign to encourage Moses that God is who he says he is. But here's the wonderful thing about this sign. In, in verse 13, uh, 12 is the sign, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Now what I find amazing about this sign is that God is trying to encourage Moses, and he says, hey, after you do that big job I told you to do, this is the sign that I actually sent you to go do it. You will worship me here with all the Israelites. Now, brothers and sisters, this is the greatest sign and wonder that we can gather as a people to worship God. Today, we can experience the same wonder that Moses experienced that we read about in the Bible when we remember that God has brought us here to worship him. And when we remember that, we can remember the next great sign that God gave to Moses. He gave Moses his own name. In Hebrew, it is Yahweh. We translate that as I am. Before, the Israelites just knew God as well, God. They knew him as the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they didn't know the name of God. Praise be to God that he reveals his name to Moses and the Israelites. And praise be to God that the name of God is continued to be revealed to us today. As we read in the New Testament, the name of Jesus is given to us, his followers. We are the church, his bride. We have his name so that when he sends us out into the world to do big tasks, tasks that seem impossible, we do not go alone, but we go with the name and the power of God. These are signs and wonders that he's given us, the gift to worship him and the ability to call upon his name. But sometimes those signs and wonders aren't enough, so God has to do other signs. Now, we don't read about it today, but in chapter 4, we learn about the sign of the staff and the snake, of uh, leprosy of Moses' hand, and of turning the water, into the, the water of the Nile into blood. These are signs that are supposed to indicate to Pharaoh and all the people of Israel and Egypt that the Lord God is here, and you better listen. Now today, we don't have to worry about staffs being turned into snakes. We don't have to worry about water being turned into blood or being stricken with leprosy. But we are given a sign today, the sign of communion, the bread and the wine. We even had the sign of our baptism, where the water of baptism through faith washes us clean by the power of Christ's blood. Brothers and sisters, these are simple things, ordinary things, everyday things, and there's nothing magical about them. But these are signs that God has given us so that we may better understand what he has done, better understand what he has spoken to us. And through these signs, our faith grows stronger. 
For as the Heidelberg tells us, as surely as we eat the bread and as surely as we drink the cup, so also we are assured that we are united with Jesus Christ our Lord, who is seated on the throne of heaven. That is a wonderful thing to remember. And we do need to remember each and every day, because each and every day, Satan tries to distract us and cause us to forget the wonder of the gospel. So today, brothers and sisters, remember the wonder of the gospel, that God calls us his own, and we can call God our own. We can call him by name. We can call him Jesus, for he calls us by our own names. So brothers and sisters, let that wonder fill your heart, that your faith be strengthened. Have assurance that nothing in this world can separate us from the love of God. For nothing can stop you from eating and drinking the bread, so also nothing will stop Jesus from calling you his beloved. Now, does that mean we're going to be perfect in all that we do? Well, in our story today, we see Moses beginning to argue with God. And in chapter 4, we see him continue to argue and argue. And later on in the story of Exodus, we're going to see the people of Israel sin and fall away. They're going to make the golden calf. They're going to blunder. And they're even going to ask to go back to Egypt, back into the land of slavery. And so our own lives, how often do we argue with God? How often do we wish to turn back and enter into the world? But let me remind you that God is faithful. And like a good shepherd, he is not going to let a single sheep of his wander away. He always brings us back. And this, brothers and sisters, is because we are made in his own image. We have the ability to talk with God, just as Moses did so long ago. We're able to pray to him, even argue with God about the things that are happening in our lives. Now, that might sound outrageous, but we see it in the Bible. God's people asking God to change something in their lives. There are times when God listens and he relents, but there are other times when he calls them to obey. But the most important thing is, is that they are talking with God. So today, brothers and sisters, remember to talk with God, for we are coming to his table. And so let us be good guests, not strangers, but rather children of God, the very bride of Christ. Let us have a conversation of love and faithfulness. For God is faithful, and he always calls us home. And with that is a wonderful thing. Praise be to God that we are his children. In God's name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as a hymn of response, we join me in singing number 157, The Love of God.
servicio. Children of God, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks and praise to the Lord our God. Let us pray. With joy we pray to you, O gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth, and you have made us in your image. You keep covenant with us even when we fall into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came among us as the Word made flesh to show us your glory, full of grace and truth. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. And we pray together, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ, send your Holy Spirit to be upon us. We pray that the bread which we break may be to us the communion of the body of Christ, and the cup which we bless may be to us the blood of Christ. Grant that, being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things in Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many hills into one cup, and these grapes from many vines into one cup, Grant, O Lord, that the whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. This time, I invite the elders to come forward and lead us in the Lord's Supper. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Take, eat, remember, and believe.
The bread which we break is our participation in the body of Christ. In the same way, after they had eaten, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The cup of blessing which we bless is our participation in the blood of Christ. Brothers and sisters, just as grains have been gathered from many fields into one loaf and grapes from many hills into one, so also we who are many are gathered together into the body of Christ. Therefore, let everything we do be united in Jesus. Will you please rise to receive the parting blessing? Children of God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn to you and give you peace. As we go out today, let us go out singing number 105, We Will Glorify. <laughs>